Today, I want us to look at um, a little bit again of the life of here David and then learn some lessons. And the title that I've given to it is The Lord is with him. And that was what I would say that something that was said about David when he became, when he was anointed to be king. And we'll be looking at first Samuel, in the first place, chapter 16, from 14 to 23. Um, it says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul said, and said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek a man who is cunning, player of the harp. And it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in plain, and a mighty, filiant man, a man of war, prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. So here is where the title came from. And the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him. He loved him greatly and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent Jesse saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. And it came to pass when the evil spirit of the Lord was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Amen. So here we are looking at this scenario. Not long after David was anointed, I will use the word secretly, by Samuel, um, the Spirit of the Lord left Saul, and then things started going downwards. The problem is that which happened to Saul, we can consider it as a judgment of God, because what God really did was he withdrew the help of the Holy Spirit from Saul, and then the direction or all the privileges that the Holy Spirit gives to the children of God in that sense, he lost them. And the word of God says that another spirit from God, that's how he said, came to torment Saul. So one thing, without the Holy Spirit, Saul was effectively no longer the king, really. And he was just hanging on. It was just a matter of time before things were to change. And as a Christians, we know that the Spirit of God does not depart from us because of the promise of Jesus that he will stay with us forever. But it is a lesson that we should learn from what happened to Paul, or to Saul, rather. Um, that we should not do things which the Word of God says will grieve the Holy Spirit by willful sinning or quench the spirit, as um, Paul puts it. Now, when we do that, and he becomes silent, that's how I'll put it, the privileges that we have with God um, become dumb, and that means we, are, we will not be able to enjoy what God has given us. So this is a lesson that we should learn from what Paul um, Saul did. So we should make sure that we don't quench the spirit. We should stay in line with God. And if we look at Romans 6, 21 to 22, no more to find it, I'll read it from here. 
He says, for the end of those things is death. That is Paul talking about salvation and what we get from it. And then says that now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. So he described a Christian that were slaves initially to sin from birth. But once you become a child of God, you become the slave of God. And what it then means is we have to follow the orders of the master. And then he points out something else, that the fruit that we get from becoming slaves of God or children of God leads to sanctification and in the end eternal life. So you can say that we've been saved for sanctification. And this is what we've been saying all along. We cannot behave like the way the world um, does things. If you are children of God, God has saved us, but after salvation, it's a long process which is called sanctification. And if we want to put it in another way, it says holy life, lead a holy life. Um, From the Old Testament side, the Holy Spirit was not necessarily given for salvation, but most of the time he was given to people to be able to do the work of God, those selected people. We see some examples with Othaniel and Gideon. Probably I'll read that of Othaniel, which is in Judges 3, 9 to 10. It says, but when the people of Israel cried out unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. Othaniah, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's young bro younger brother, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him and he judged Israel. He went out to war and the Lord gave Cushan Rithamiam, king of Mesopotamia, to his hand and he prevailed over Cushan. So that is one example of it. We also see this in Gideon that when the Spirit of God came upon Gideon, he was able to perform the assignments in the Old Testament. He goes and on and on and on like that. Um, so at that time, it wasn't necessary for salvation, but it was meant to empower people to do the work of God. I think that function is also still there in the current world. Our advantage is he dwells in us. He doesn't say that he comes upon us. He's already in us. Because the word of God says that if the spirit of God is not in you, then you are none of Christ. So the Holy Spirit is here with us. And once that he's here with us, what we have to do, the lessons that they are giving us is we should not quench the spirit. Um, when Saul did that with all his disobedience, what he ended up, the Holy Spirit left him. And then everything went the other way around. Um, and the evil spirit of the Lord came to him. And if one should ask, why will God send an evil spirit to come to um, torment or trouble Saul? Um, as he said, what we should recognize is that God using um, the messengers of Satan for his purposes is not new. If we look at the story of Job, Satan went to God, and then God said, that, Behold, he's in your hands, but spare his life. And then he came and tempted Job several ways. That is unimaginable, but Job stood his ground. We also see another scenario when um, Micah was telling the king of Israel that he should go to war, and then he was going to win. And all his prophets were prophesying the same thing. And then at that time, king of Judah was visiting them. So king of Judah asked whether there's no other prophet in the land. And then the king of Israel said, oh, there's one prophet, but he doesn't say anything good about me. So I don't want to call him. And the king of Judah said, I want that guy, bring him. So they brought him. And he said a different thing that he's going to lose. And then the king of Israel said, you see, I told you. This man never prophesied anything good about me. And then the leader of his prophets came and slapped, um, slapped him. And then this is what he said. And Micah said, 
Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the hosts of heaven standing beside him, on his right hand and on his left hand. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab, that he may go up and fall at the rim of Gilead? And one said one thing, and another said another. Then the spirit came forward and stood before the Lord, saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, By what means? And he said, I will go out and will be a lying spirit in, his, in the mouth of his prophets. And he said, You are to entice him, and you will succeed. So go and do that. So here, what it means is when God wants judgment, he can use anything at all. He can even use the devil as a form of judgment. So in that sense, what he was doing to Saul was a form of judgment. And that is here, we have to recognize that God is sovereign and he does anything that he wants. But with respect to Saul's case, the purpose of it was, at least we can figure it out, and that is he wanted to bring David in. And the way to bring David in, David was so far away doing his shepherding stuff, and there was no way that he was going to come to the throne, um, to the courts. He has to learn how to be king, and there will be no training for him where he was. So that was a way for God to bring David in. So God intentionally allowed an evil spirit to torment Saul. And that is why we cannot second guess God when he's doing things, because we don't really know um, the purpose of it. And if he hasn't revealed it to us, it's not something that we may know. And we cannot sit down and pass judgment on the work of God. Um, these things also even happen in the New Testament. I think I'll mention two of them. The first one is um, happened in Corinthians when somebody was sleeping with his father's wife and the Corinthians were happy. No, there was nothing being done. And Paul had to write to them in 1 Corinthians 5, 4 to 5. He says, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, Spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So here the purpose of it was to bring repentance so that the person is saved. He doesn't go down the drain. Here that is, I would say it is the mercy of God that he was doing. But here he was, the person was supposed to be handed over to Satan, meaning that just like what happened to Saul, that he has to be tormented so that he comes to his senses. We look at a similar thing also in Timothy. And Paul wrote again to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, 18 to 20. He says, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, by rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith. Among them are Himaneus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So here also is another form of, I believe, is the same thing, so that they will not go astray. So at times God uses harsh means to bring us back. And that is when, if we admonish not to quench the spirit, we should try and we should listen. Because if God steps in, uh, maybe the way he would do it wouldn't be what we would like. And it also happened, God allowed Satan to more or less tempt, if I can use the word, Peter. And as Jesus said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you. Meaning that Satan said, I want to have Peter. And God said, go ahead. And Jesus prayed for him that he might sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned, you may strengthen your brethren. Your brethren. So this is what happened here in this respect. And that is with Peter, the purpose of it was to strengthen him so that he will know that 
without Christ, he's nothing. That lesson will come in well, and then he will be able to help other brethren. And it also happened, as the word of God says, for our benefit. Um, so if I should say we should give room for the sovereignty of God to act, and as Christians, we should not be frightened when certain things happen. Most of the times when things happen to us, um, the first thing that we tend to think of, the devil is up to get me. The devil is doing, and the question now asks is, where is God then? God is your father, right? So if anything is going to happen, he should know it first. He must have known it even from eternity. So why are we panicking, moving towards the devil? The first thing we should do is to go to God. And then if it's a matter of repentance, fine, we go ahead, repent, and then come online. If it's not and anything, anything that God allows to happen, at least there is a purpose to it. So it's possible that our faith is weak and he wants us to rely on him. Whatever it is, I cannot, um, there are several reasons that could be. But the first place that we should get to when we run into trouble is we should go to God. Even before we do the other things that are demanded as human beings, there are certain things that we are supposed to do that God will not necessarily come and do for us. But in everything, we have to first take it to God. And just to bring this home, this is a lesson that Nebuchadnezzar learned very well. When he thought he was, um, if I can say he was the man, and God send him to the wilderness. Uh, look, we'll uh, read it from Daniel 4, 34 to 35. He says, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. So when he recognized the sovereignty of God, God allowed things to come better for him. And he says, And I bless the Most High and praise and honor him who lives forever. For his dominion is everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are counted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? So here, when Nebuchadnezzar came to recognize this, when God is acting, we have... There's no business of you second guessing. That is what he's saying. He does what he wants. And not only on earth, in heaven also he does anything. So God can send Satan to come and do something. And then you cannot argue with him or complain that why are you doing this? Um, because he's God. And that is something that we have to recognize. And we've been privileged, being the children of God, we have access to the throne because of Jesus Christ, the throne room, that we can any time go there, and the word of God says that we will receive help in time of trouble. So let us take advantage of this, and as we do that, let us also remember what the Lord has done for us. Um, So when we come back to Saul, that the evil spirit of the Lord has come back, was tormenting him, and Saul so had, um, I would say, counselors. As the word of God said, that in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. So what they said was, hey, you know what is happening to you? The evil spirit of the Lord is troubling you. So let us get somebody who can play the music so that when the evil spirit is troubling you, the music will soothe you and things will go on well. And then Saul said, yeah, get me someone. Um, the first thing that, with that respect, what we have to learn from is the fact that the people did not, the counselors were not afraid to speak to power when they saw something going on wrongly. So the man, they were able to tell Saul plainly what his problem was. And that is something that we should cultivate also. The only thing is, in pointing out stuff, we should do that in love and with humility. Otherwise, the message will not go through. The only thing is, the therapy that they gave 
I would say it's a wrong therapy. But at least that is what they said. The servants were honored, and they encouraged Saul to seek help by music therapy. All this, behind all this, God is, was working behind the scenes to bring David in, as we know. So, as somebody said, that by providence, God arranged Saul's counselors to be there at the right time, and that particular person who made the suggestion were there at the right time. So, one thing also that we recognize here is God says that we can make all our plans, but he is the one who directs the steps. And the proverb puts it, the heart of man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. So that is important. Always we have to be cognizant of the Lord. We have to make room for God. Because even when we put our plans together, um, God is saying that it may not necessarily happen, but even if it's happening, he is the one who is going to direct things um, for it to happen. And normally we tend to call that um, providence. So providentially, God was arranging for David to come. So at the point when it was suggested that Saul should seek music therapy, somebody was right there to say, oh, I know somebody. David, the son of Jesse, he can play well, do certain things, and then David was brought in as we know it. But one question that we may ask is, Saul was suffering, and they knew that his suffering was due to um, God sending an evil spirit and coming to him. So one would wonder, why didn't they give the right remedy? If you have a problem with God, and God is punishing you, why don't you go to God and they ask for forgiveness? Why didn't he seek repentance like David did? So this is a lesson that we should learn. Why did he first go for the worldly remedy before consulting God? We can ask the question, why didn't he reach out to Samuel and say, Samuel, irrespective of what I've done, go and plead with God for, for me, intercede for me. And then, because that was the source of the problem, the source of the problem was God. Yes, but they didn't look at that. They look at the worldly solution, which by itself is not bad, but they should have looked at God first, and then probably added the music therapy to it, because if God commanded, or God commands that, yeah, it's enough, we've troubled Saul enough, all the problem will be solved. But they didn't do that. So this is a lesson that we should learn also, that when there is trouble, the first thing that we have to do is to go to God. Yes, we may apply the worldly wisdom that we know, and those ones are not to be neglected because God has really given that wisdom for living in the world. So those wisdoms should not be neglected, but we should really go to the one who can make a difference, and that is the Lord himself. So that is where our attention should be whenever um, there is trouble, whenever something is troubling us. We should look at God first. So secondly, we come back to the music side. Why did they recommend music therapy? We know music can do a lot of things. And one thing is it can really arouse passion in the sexual direction. It can cause agitation and bring routes and others. People will use it even to be able to induce trance and get in contact with demons. There are music like that. So music by itself is not neutral. We also use music to praise God here and there. So music is not neutral. So in that respect, we should also be careful about the type of music we listen to or we enjoy. Um, Unfortunately, it looks like the worldly music, the melodies are normally nice, so we get attracted to them. But this is something that we should look at and probably try to change our ways and go back to things, music which glorifies God. And also music was used for good things. This Elisha used it, and this Asaph also used it. So I'll read Elisha one. Elisha said, but now bring me a musician 
And when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him. So the music is able to put you in a condition for you to hear better from God. So the whole of there is a good side and there's a bad side. So we should be careful the type of music we're listening to. Um, also the children of Asaph did that. It says that David and the chiefs of the service also set apart for the service of the sons of Asaph and of Haman and of Judithon, who prophesied with lies, with harps and with cymbals, etc. So here also you can use music to bring you in line with God. And that is what we do when there's praise and worship, which tries to bring us, put us in a condition to better hear from God. So there are a lot of things with music that should not be um, overlooked. There's a good side and there's a bad side. So we should be careful when the type of music we listen to. So let's come to um, 1 Samuel 16, 18. Again, um, he says, One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. So what was being narrated here, that the, what I would say, the characteristics or the commendation of David was the work of the Holy Spirit on him. It was said that, um, as the British will say, that he's, he was fit for purpose, meaning that all around David was, was a man in that sense. So that was a recommendation, that he can play the um, the instrument they have very, very well. He was a comely person, meaning that he was a pleasant person to be around with. He was very courageous also, not afraid of anything. And then he spoke nicely, prudent in speech, meaning that even if he confronts you, the, the guy was good. And he was prudent in all matters, means he had wisdom. Um, that was a youth. And he says that the most important thing why is all this happening? Because God is with him. So the question that we should ask ourselves is, are we seeing some of these characteristics with us? Because we are in a different position, a better position than even David, because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Paul and for David, he came upon him. So if he even got these characteristics by coming upon him, what about us in whom the Holy Spirit dwells? And we know that we've been given that, been told the fruit of the Spirit. There are certain things which um, has to pop up in our lives. So if these things are not happening, maybe we should ask God. It should be something that should be a prayer point for us so that God will move us in that direction. Because God is with us. God was with David and God is with us. So these, these characteristics should somehow um, be seen in our lives. If they are not, it should be something that we should work on, that we should pray for, that we should ask God to give us. And someone will say that when the Spirit of God comes upon a man, he will make his face shine. Um, that is another way of saying it. And all in life, we recognize that um, the saints of God are recognized by the fruit they bear and especially wisdom. So if we look at Samuel and Jesus, Samuel he says that now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. And with Jesus he says, and the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. So when the favor of God is on you, your face will shine. So that is something that we should cultivate. God dwelling in us means that he's already there. What we have to do is avail ourselves to the important things that or the, what someone would say in the Psalms that will be able to dwell from the wells of salvation. That the privileges that God has given us, we may be able to enjoy, enjoy them. Um, and when David was in the presence of Saul, he excelled. So we know what happened. Saul 
went back and told Jesse, David's father, hey, let your son remain with me because he's been doing very well. And he has become one of my armor bearers. So David was resolved for a while, learning more or less like he was an apprentice. When he was there, he would be able to see all the things which happens, um, if you can say, in high places. He'll be able to see the flattery, He'll be, because he wasn't the king's son where certain things would be hidden from him. He'll be able to see what goes on the hypocrisy and how people are trying to get favor from the big boss and also the humility which comes in in serving someone. So all these things were important lessons that um, God arranged with what happened to Saul so that David will learn on his way to become a king. So one thing also, when God gives assignments, we know that he makes a provision for things to move in the right direction. If you come back again, um, because the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul, and I'm sure the Philistine must have heard that Saul has fallen out of favor with Samuel, so the spiritual backbone was no more there, and there was no godly person to advise him, so they decided to attack. So they came to the valley of Elah, and there they gathered themselves that they were going to fight. So one thing that we may learn from this is the enemy of the church, the enemy of the children of God, will take advantage when we disassociate ourselves from things that God has provided, when we don't commune with God, when we don't study the word of God to be in line, when we don't obey what we know God has told us, we give the, uh, the chance of the enemy to attack. So here when Saul didn't have the spiritual backbone, the enemy, I would say, God allowed it anyway, but the enemy instigated the Philistines to come in and wage war against um, the Israelites. So when we neglect the Holy Spirit, when we refuse to do what God has commanded us to do, we can run into this trouble. So in chapter 70, we know that they got it, and Saul was forced also to rally the Israelites and gather. Unfortunately, here we don't hear anything that Saul consulted God in any way. Previously, he would have, but he had nothing. He just gathered his people. And they were also camped somewhere along the valley. And we know what happened. Goliath came out every day, I think twice a day, for about 40 days. And whenever he came, all that he said was, give me somebody who can fight me. And if the person is able to defeat me, yes, will be your servant. But if I win, then you'll be my servant. And everybody was afraid. Saul was in his tent. And what was he doing? He looked around and said, okay, um, whoever can go and fight Goliath and win, oh, this is what I'll do for you. You be exempted from all taxes. I'll give you money. And when nobody was coming for he added, I'll give you my daughter um, as a wife. And still nobody came. And whenever Goliath came around, the Israelites would panic. So let's look at First Samuel 17, 10 to 11, and see. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that they might fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So we see what happened. Now, Goliath will come every day and make this proclamation, and, well, everybody will be afraid. Nobody wants to go. Jonathan probably could have been the person to go, but I remember what happened when um, he went and attacked, and then Paul said that nobody should eat, and if he is, that person should be killed. So more or less, he has really clipped his arms. He will not go. So everybody was afraid. 
even the things that God, um, the Saul had promised, nobody wanted to do that. So the Israel has lost its leader. The courage of Saul was gone. Saul wasn't consulting God. He was, the first thing that he did was trying to rely on what I would say, bribing and rewards for somebody to come forward and fight. He wouldn't go and fight himself. And then um, Goliath was there insulting them, telling them that they should bring somebody who can face him. And if that person is able to do it, then there will be the assailments. So let's jump to um, verse 21. And he says, for Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his courage in the hands of the keeper of the courage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And he says, and as he talked with them, behold, they came up the champion, this Philistine of God, Goliath, by name, out of the armies of the Philistine, and speak according to the same words, and David heard them. So here it is. We know that God was working behind the scenes providentially. So when this war started, David had apparently gone back to his father. And because I think he was a youth, Saul didn't want to involve him. And what did he do? He knew he was supposed to be the king, but he went back to shepherd. He went back to the sheep. So his father was there, and his father said, Hey, David, you know your brothers, your three brothers are in the battlefront. And I want you to send, I want to send you to go and see them and see how they are doing. And probably he was worried about them or whatever it is. So David was giving provisions and then he set out and then he went. And when he reached there, and that's what we're reading here, he gave whatever provisions to the keeper and then said, I'm going to see what is going on here. Why these armies are arranged. Um, that time they will line up one there, one there, as if they want to fight. And when he went, he heard again what Goliath was saying. So, so he's heard a challenge that Goliath was insulting them, that they are cowards, they should bring somebody to fight. And this is here David has come in, and he heard it. And if I should read from 24 saying, all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrage the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel, meaning they won't pay taxes. And David said to the man who stood by him, what shall be done to the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that will defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him the same way, so it shall be done. So this is David. He's seeing what is going on. And there's one thing which is coming in here. When the Spirit of the Lord is upon you, the glory of God becomes important. So when he saw that, he was, if I can use the word, he was boiling up. So the zeal of the Lord was stirring him. The Holy Spirit was stirring him up. And again, this was the work of God. He was positioning David to show something. I've sent you to go and learn how we behave as kings. You see the good and the bad. And now I'm bringing you to the battlefront. You were nowhere near it. Nobody knew we were going to come here. But when he went there, the Spirit of God upon him started agitating him, bringing the zeal that why would somebody defy God like this? And then everybody's afraid. What is going on here? Um, he was so much concerned about the honor of God. So if we look at um, it again, I think verse, 
Okay, I'll, I'll come there later on. One thing that we should recognize, Saul was completely drained of all enthusiasm to fight the battle. And just because he has disobeyed God repeatedly, so he has lost his strength, so he has lost his mojo. Wisdom was not there for him anymore. And so with this respect, both David and Saul were fulfilling the proverb which Solomon said, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. So that is why because of, I would say, the righteousness of David, when he saw this, he was so bold, but what about Saul? Because of relationship with God in the south direction, he was afraid he was running. He needed somebody. So we can say that obedience to God builds courage. And when the Holy Spirit is working in you, he incites the zeal to glorify God and then to lead holy lives. So here, when people heard it, they made mention of uh, David's um, inquiries to the king, and they brought David to Saul. And here, verse 33, it says that, And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servants used to keep his father's sheep, and when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if it arose against me, I caught him by the beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall not uh, shall be like one of them. So do you see the boldness of David? For he, he gave a reason why, for he has defied the armies of the living God. So David, the zeal of the Holy Spirit makes him very sensitive to the honor of God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paws of the lion and from the paws of the bear would deliver me from the hands of this Philistine. So again, David's confidence, all that he was saying was in God. So Saul said to David, go, and the Lord will be with you. So if we can say, Paul has, Saul has been seeking somebody for a long time to defend Israel, and here comes somebody who is young. I don't even know whether Saul recognized him that it was David. Then Saul says that, yeah, you have no experience in war. This guy has been fighting from his childhood, and there's no way that you'll be able to face him. Hey, you can do it. David didn't have any credentials that he's been to war. He wasn't trained for war like the conventional way. But what did David say? David said, yeah, I know that I'm not like you guys who have been trained for war, but I keep the sheep. And when keeping the sheep, I face bears and I face lions. I've been able to conquer them. But in fact, I was able to do that because God helped me. God delivered me from these lions and these bears. So I can do it. And this guy is going down because God is going to do it for me. So what was happening here, David had faith in God. So the Spirit of God inside him to have faith in God, that's the second thing. The first thing is the zeal for God that the Holy Spirit gives, if we are in tune with him. The second one here that we see is he gives us the faith, to have faith in God, not faith in our abilities or anything. And here he was to convince humans, he told Saul that, hey, look, um, I believe God can do it, and God can do it through me, but if you want anything, I've been able to conquer bears and lions, and God is the one who helped me do it. So he can do it this time also. So that is, here is the comparison between David and Saul. Saul was running away from God. He was afraid when the trouble came. 
he wanted someone to go and do the fighting for him. And nobody will do that. And here comes David because of the Holy Spirit was on him. He was so bold, he was zealous for the Lord, that things which are happening against God, which was more or less like disgracing God, that you say God is the God of the universe. And then he brings some Philistine here, and he says, come and let's fight, and nobody is able to do that. The Spirit of God was stirring him. And again, comes the second part of it. And the second part of it is the reason why he was so agitated is, yeah, I believe in God. I have faith in God. He can work through me to defeat this guy. Um, so the spirit is inciting zeal. He's also bringing faith, that his faith is in God, so that you'll be able to pursue things. Um, as we, the word of God says, that without faith it's impossible to please God. So this is where it's coming in. And faith, as we know, is a gift of God. To each of us is given the measure of faith by the Holy Ghost. So he is the one who gives us that faith. And that is why we always have to be, um, should I say, that in close relationship with him in all things that we do. So that the faith that is needed for things to happen, we will have it when we ask God. If we don't have the faith, one thing we should do is to ask God for faith. So now the third aspect that the Holy Spirit was giving David was wisdom. He was inciting wisdom in David. So if we look at verse 38, he says, Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go. He had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with this, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. So here comes, he was going to face Goliath, and he has to get an armor. When we're going to war, that is the type of thing that you put on, so that you can go and fight. But then, the Holy Spirit was working behind the scenes. They are not going to use this. So he didn't give him the opportunity to practice, use this type of things. So he tried to put it on for the first time, and he says that, nope. You are not going to use this. So David was able to use wisdom that the Holy Spirit has given him to figure out that I cannot go to war. I cannot face the Goliath with the worldly um, garment that they've given to me. I have to do it the way that I know best. I have to do it the way that I've always done it, the way that God has helped me to do it. That is the way I'm going to do it. And quite apart from that, if we look at verse 28, when David came in um, and he was asking questions, his elder brother was so mad. So he said, now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness. I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. So here he was also fighting another fight. His brother is saying, hey David, why are you doing here? I know you are a bad guy, you're a bad boy, if I can say that. You've just come here to see this war which is going on. I know you are evil. So David was very self-constrained, more or less. The Holy Spirit has given him wisdom, the best way to respond. So David said, what have I done now? Was it not by the word? So the Holy Spirit, when he's with us, he gives us wisdom that in any situation that we are in, the way to respond. So he was able to respond. After all, he didn't have any beef with his brother. His character was being maligned by his brother that he was evil, but that was not what he was there for. That was not what was um, boiling in him. What was boiling in him is, was, how can somebody defy God like this and get away with it and nobody can do anything? That was what he was in. So 
when the Holy Spirit was restrained from this error, the error of responding to his brother, there could have been a sibling fight right there big time. But he didn't. He moved away. So that is some of the wisdom that the Holy Spirit gives. And when he was talking with Saul also, he talked humbly. He wasn't proud. Just pointing out that God has used him in certain ways so God can do the same thing. So he was relying on his confidence in God and the wisdom God has given him to move forward. Um, with all this, we should also come back and realize that we know that we as children of God in this generation, we are better off than them. And if they could have, they could have all these characteristics, it means those characteristics are there for us. They are inherently there because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And if you want the proof, um, Jesus said in Matthew 11, 11, he said, truly I said to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. So Jesus was saying that, all the Old Testament people, John the Baptist is the greatest. And then he went on to say, yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So Jesus is telling us, hey, all those things that have happened in the Old Testament, there's only one person who helped them do that. I mean, things for God. That we admire so much, like David we are talking about. And that is the Holy Spirit. And their situation was a bit different. We here, even the one a Christian, we, is, we say, if I can use the word, weakest Christian, we have a better advantage than them. So what it tells us is we have no excuse not to be able to, if I can say, overdo them. Because God has given us that provision the only thing we have to do is we have to avail ourselves. And we can only avail ourselves if we are obedient to God. If we do not do our own things, if we put God in the first place, if we factor God in all that we do, if we do that, we can avail to such heights, if I can say that. And it all comes with our relationship with God, with our relationship with the Holy Spirit, so that He dwelling in us, will be able to do things in such a way that even those things that we read in the Bible that we get so amazed of will not be out of reach for us. So if I should conclude, when the Spirit of the Lord is with us as with David, He gives us a favor to perform with excellence. And if that is not there, we are to go and ask. We should ask and it will be given to us. The third thing is, he incites zeal for the glory of the Lord. So if we find ourselves that we are not enthusiastic about things of God, it means we are lacking something, something important that the Holy Spirit was giving to the old guys. We should ask God. We should go to the throne of grace. So there should be a prayer point. He incites to have faith in God. Here, with the Holy Spirit, he gives us faith. And the faith is not faith for us to do whatever we want, but have faith in God. So that we'll be able to obey him and be able to do his will. And then he grants us wisdom in our daily lives. The way that we behave, the way that we react, every situation is different, but with the Holy Spirit, he gives us the ability to be able to do that. And if we should remember what Isaiah said in Isaiah 11, two and three, when he was talking about Jesus, and by default, what we have when the Holy Spirit is with us, he says, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. 
the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. We have all these. That is the, what we normally say, the sevenfold spirit of the living God. This is what God has put in us that we have to cultivate. And then all this is there, and it says, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. It's our delight, or our delight in the fear of the Lord. We have the spirit of the Lord in us. So we have the spirit of wisdom and understanding. We have wisdom in our daily lives. Do you have understanding of things of God? The spirit of counsel and might. Are we counseled by the Holy Spirit in such a way that our lives move in the right direction? The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Do we respect our Father? Do we respect our Lord to be able to stay on track? And it's our delight in the fear of the Lord. These are certain things that we should think about. And these are the things that I think today the Lord is telling us. That if we don't have them, we should cultivate. We see the Old Testament guys had all this when they were disadvantaged compared to us. We have the Holy Spirit in us. What are we doing? May the Lord help us and bless his word. Amen.